Anybody who wants to say something, we've got the microphone here, so just come forward and we can sing again if everybody wants. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not the best public speaker. I'm great at fighting in a courtroom with 10 fat headed jurists. What I did hear was when you said, Will this sign or would these signs change one juror's mind? And I have to tell you, that you can't help every day that you're walking into the courts to see a community of people out there holding these signs, talking to the news, sitting in the jury, sitting in the courtroom every day, surrounding the family, all day, every day, and not have it touch you, not have it affect you, and not have you realize that there's something special, that this isn't normal, and this isn't something that just anybody gets. So. For that reason, I did have to come up and say something. This is important. But beyond that, one of the stories I was telling a gentleman outside was when we all first went into the courtroom for our, our guardavir to be asked questions, to find out if we could be on a jury, I didn't even know what Dr. L. Aaron looked like. And I told one of the people next to me that I didn't know what he looked like. He said, I'll point him out when we go into the room. And we did. We sat down. He goes, that's Dr. L. Aaron. And I saw this very large black man with no neck <laughs> very intimidating and very scary, and I said, oh, is that Dr. L. Aaron? He said, no, 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 it's the man next to him. And I saw Dr. L. Aaron, and I said, he looks like a teacher. <laughs> and the guy next to me said, he is a teacher. <laughs> and I just thought, I felt really bad when I said that because I immediately just went to the thing that I saw and let some yeah, what, what you prejudice... Think, uh, what, what do you think when you saw the, the, his attorney? I thought he was a terrorist. I, I thought he was... <laughs> I'm sorry, and, and it's something that's inside of you that you just can't get out of, but it's, it's important that you realize that we have to go with the thing. We have to take those things out of our mind. We have to not look at something and make judgments. But we also have to remember the things that we see, like communities that are taking care of people. And when we went into our jury room for the first vote, the first minute we were in there, and we decided to take our first vote. They pointed to the first person, and they said, how do you vote? And she said, I don't know. I need to hear more. And then they went around the room, and it was 10 guilties and one not guilty. And proud to say I was the one not guilty. And uh, we went through, and we did several, uh, 
several uh, charges and voted on it, and it became 10 to 2 or 7 to uh, 3 to, to 9. But after it was all over with, when we were getting ready to leave, the juror in the beginning that said, I want to hear more, came up to me. She said, how strong do you feel about Dr. Alarian being innocent? I said, I don't know, because I really haven't seen or heard everything. It was kind of boring sometimes, and my mind would wander. <laughs> and I would sit and think if I left my coffee maker on that morning. And I said, I'm hoping if we sit and we talk, and there's any information out there that I missed, they'll share it with me, and then I'll know. And she said, well, I kind of did spend as you know, much time as I could listening and, and paying attention to, I don't hear anything. I didn't hear anything. And in the days that we had talked about the charges, nobody was able to come up with anything that made me think any differently than I did when I walked in there. In fact, I found out that even though I, my mind wandered, I was probably one of the more literate people in there as far as the, the facts that, that were going on. And so she just turned to me and she said, listen, if you be my rock, I will be your rock. If you don't crumble, I won't crumble. We'll lean on each other. And we did. And it, for two weeks, we fought and screamed and yelled and pounded on tables and said some things to each other from me, which I'm ashamed of, but also from the other people, which were very hurtful. But we, we fought, and we stood by each other, and we protected each other, and we did everything we could to make sure that we stayed strong. And a community has to do that, and your community did that. Your church did that, your community did that, your people did that, and that's so important. And we need to teach our children that. That's important. Sometimes, sometimes one voice screaming in a jury room is enough, but sometimes you have to be a larger group. Sometimes you have to march over bridges and through cities, and sometimes you have to hold signs on street corners. But we all have to do our part, and we all have to support each other, and we all have to let each other know that we're there for them, and we have to help them. Because really, in all honesty, it does have an effect. It really does. Okay? Thank you. Yeah, Save a Lot grocery store has huge pieces of white cardboard. And as I said, as we're driving and I'm telling Greg, do you think some paint and a piece of cardboard from the back of the uh, car could make one juror think something different? And we're not taking any credit for that. But again, I'm just saying, everything you do could make some kind of a difference somewhere. And these guys were part of the artistic team, so I'm going to pass this over to Mauricio. Thank you. For, for a while, uh, I was sure if it was really solidarity with Sammy in Palestine or competition with our art between, <laughs> between Greg and myself. Yeah, no, but it was beautiful to see other people obviously involved. Um, I believe in solidarity. I've been doing this work for about 35 years. And, um, you know, solidarity doesn't recognize borders, doesn't recognize uh, any barriers made by the man, made by men, you know, so. So to me, uh, it was so natural to work in the, uh, you know, with the Palestinians, uh, just like have done it with Mexico and had done other countries. Uh, so uh, I was involved in, in with the struggle with the Palestinians in the uh, 70s. No, no, sorry, in the 80s in Los Angeles. Uh, I've been, you know, obviously being supportive of Sami uh, Ryan, and we've been denouncing all the. Uh, uh, Israel uh, abuses of human rights against his people. So uh, uh, I really thank you all, you know, the, for being here and to support Sammy and all the family, because uh, uh, we all are Palestinian. And, and last thing I want to say is, I realized when I was sitting in, in the room before we came over here that. If any one of us got in trouble for freedom of speech or for political issue, if you're looking for the people to bail you out, they're in this room right here. Look around, because these are the people you're going to need. God bless you all. Thank you. Yeah, and, uh, thank you so much for Sammy for for his courage and to his family for his for their support and solidarity for for their, their, their family. Thank you. Good day. Oh, you got to turn it on. There's a little switch. I turned it off because I know I noise. Oh, thank you.
Uh, my name is Doris Norito, and I am at present an independent journalist. In the beginning of the Al Arian tri trial, I tried to be very objective. I saw the people that were standing outside with signs for justice. I went over across the street and met an Israeli couple who were, I had lost their daughter. My sympathies were with them, but also with justice. I was a little, uh, well, disoriented at the time. I didn't know what to believe. I knew eventually, after meeting Sammy once in jail, uh, that I had to go to Palestine to find out the truth. So my first trip was in 2008. I didn't want to go on an Israeli tour, so I somehow made contact with an activist over there named um, Mazen Kunsia. And he wrote to me, and I still have it, in an email, he said, Sammy was one of us until he was unjustly targeted. And at that point I said, well, what does this mean? Does this mean that both of them are terrorists or both of them are innocent? So at that point I really had to go to Palestine and it was there that my eyes were open. With an American passport, I can pass back and forth between <coughs> Jerusalem, the five miles away Bethlehem. My first assignment <coughs> going on a Palestinian tour was to work for IMEMC, which is the International Middle East Media Center based in Bethlehem. And they report from what's going on inside the occupied territory. These are stories you do not hear in mainstream media on the outside. You can only get them when you are actually inside the territory. I'm going to make this story short. Uh, I've been to Palestine now uh, five times. I intend to go back. There are stories everywhere, both in Jerusalem and in Palestine, because when you are in Jerusalem, you can talk to Israelis, and you can talk to people who are Israeli Arabs, Israeli Muslims, Israeli Christians, Druze, and anybody else. 20% of Israel is non-Jewish. So this is something that people don't know. Then I can go to Bethlehem and hear the Palestinian side of the story from both the Muslims and the Christians who live there. My last um, contact was at the wall. There's a huge wall with an observation tower that separates Jerusalem from Palestine. Near that wall, there is the Ida refugee camp. Inside that camp, there's a uh, organization that's run by a man named uh, let me see if I get this straight. Abdul Fattah Abruzar, and we call him Dr. Abed. He's come here and to speak. He runs, he's a drama teacher, and also the director of Al Rawad, the cultural center inside the camp. When I was there, I was taken by one of his associates to the roof of the camp, and I looked down onto the streets below in the refugee camp, which is now a series of, of uh, UN uh, blocks. At one time it was all uh, tents and so forth, but they've been replaced gradually by very small units that people live in the, within the camp. And nearby there are soldiers at the uh, observation tower and Every afternoon, they're confronted by demonstrators, often young people throwing rocks and so forth. And the soldiers come out and they throw tear gas, and the streets are just filled with tear gas. Uh, Dr. Albert said uh, he would drive me through the uh, tear gas, and uh, we were going to see a performance that he was going to give with his students, his drama and music students, at a nearby um, hotel. 
As we were driving, the tear gas began to smart up the cars and so forth, and I wanted to stop and take pictures. And he just drove with determination, and he said, we haven't got the luxury of despair. And he just rode right through. That evening, I saw a performance, a most beautiful performance I've ever seen. Four young ladies got up, and they sang in perfect English, We Shall Overcome. And besides that, there were other performances. But when you sang here, that reminded me of that situation. Anyway, in spite of what you may hear from the media, from warnings, Bethlehem, as a matter of fact, all of uh, Palestine is safe. You'll be greeted with open arms. The people are beautiful. They are thankful. The first words out of their mouth are welcome and get ready to drink tea until you're drowning in it or coffee. Uh, they invite you to their homes and everywhere you go there's nothing but an outpouring of thankfulness for listening to their side of the story. So I urge anyone who can, please make the trip and go to Palestine and not on an Israeli tour because you will avoid uh, the real Palestine. Thank you. All right, last quarter, I guess. <clears throat> Again, I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, I want to thank, thank specifically John Sarr. I know what he had to go through as a journalist. He was the exception to the rule. You know, um, throughout the maybe 12 years period, between 95 and right after the, uh, the, the end of the trial, when somebody did a Google search, there were about 1,600, I think at least, articles on the Tampa Tribune. And 99% uh, of them were negative. So it wasn't, wasn't easy, obviously, for journalists to, to look objectively at this, and I thank for those who had the courage, actually, to look beyond the cliches. When Ron was speaking, my mind went into what the government was trying to do for us, you know, during the arraignment, as the prosecutor was going through the charges, and what would be the penalty, life sentence, count one, life sentence, count two, life sentence, count three, and then add up the years. So the judge was saying, okay, so it's three life sentences plus 200 years. So no judge. It's three life sentences plus 220 years. So just in case I survive the three life sentences in 200 years, they want to make sure I do the other 20. So it's really against all odds. So that just tells me how much grateful we are for being here. Something that I never thought would ever come. But here we are. So I just want to let you know that I think in my lifetime, Palestine would be free, free, and when that happens, I would get a visa to come back, <laughs> and I will speak in this church. So thank you from the bottom of our heart for your love, for your support, for being there for us, and I hope we will continue to have contacts. Now we have this amazing technology, Skype, and what's up and what's not. So we get together. Thank you so much, Mel, for hosting us. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.